My special guest today is Professor Jennifer Paxton, award-winning writer and director of the University Honors Program at the Catholic University of America. Welcome to the show, Professor Paxton. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. If it's all right with you, I would like to, to start uh, this discussion by um, setting the stage, metaphorically speaking. Um, because by August 1027, Normandy had been in existence for just over a century. Um, a county founded by Norse invaders the, um, turned settlers had grown into a duchy. Uh, its ruler, however, Richard III, was now dead. He had been duke for uh, less than a year. Uh, could you please give us a brief overview on the status quo in Normandy at this time? This was probably a low ebb for Normandy, at least in the recent period. Uh, they had had several very strong dukes in a row, uh, but then uh, the, ro the rule of Richard uh, was beset by uh, rebellion from his younger brother. Uh, and so that brief year that he was duke, uh, was a really fractious one. Uh, and then when he died suddenly, uh, Robert took over, and there were later rumors that Robert had helped his brother along, uh, that he had in fact poisoned him. Now, there's no evidence for this. It's a later story, and anyone who died suddenly was subject to a rumor that they'd been poisoned. So there's lots and lots of rumors about poisoning in the Middle Ages. Probably most of them were not, in fact, um, uh, anything illicit. Uh, but this did dog uh, Robert's reputation a, a little bit. Uh, so he takes over slightly under a cloud. Uh, and he also has a, an irregular personal life, right? So he is not married. Uh, he has not made a high status marriage, which certainly would have helped him politically. Uh, so uh, he's only Duke for a very brief period, uh, no more than eight years. And in that time, he only manages uh, to produce an illegitimate son. Uh, so he has not actually done the best he can for the duchy by providing uh, for the succession in a more secure way. Uh, uh, but in 1034, he goes off on pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And this was a risky move. Uh, it was something that a lot of European rulers were doing at the time. Uh, so uh, a number of other uh, French noblemen, in fact, had, had done this, Counts of Anjou had gone on pilgrimage. Uh, but uh, it was a risky thing to do. Before he left, he got the major nobles of the duchy to agree to accept his illegitimate son, William, as his heir. Now, this wasn't completely out of bounds because the question of legitimacy in this period was a little bit up in the air. We're talking about a transition period in uh, mores, in views of marriage. Uh, whether someone had to be born in legitimate church-sanctioned marriage or not to inherit uh, an estate or a kingdom or a duchy or whatever, that was not completely set in stone yet. The church was just starting to really try to push through its rules on marriage with regard to a couple of things. One, on legitimacy, right, that you have to actually get married with the official sanction of the church. Um, and also indissolubility. So you could only have one wife and then you know that, that's what you had until that uh, marriage was dissolved by death. Um, so the church was starting to make inroads there, but it hadn't completely uh, made its, its will known. So it was plausible that William could have been succeed, you know, successful in taking the duchy, uh, but there was also a door open to a subsequent legitimate marriage by Robert if he returned safely from pilgrimage. And there are signs that that's what he intended to do. What he was intending to do was probably go on pilgrimage, make things right with the church and with God because he hadn't been necessarily a good boy. And when he got back, he was going to try for a legitimate and prestigious marriage. 
Is it possible that uh, Robert may have been married to Estrid, uh, Knut's half-sister, for a few months? Something that she didn't want, but uh, was forced into accepting? If so, the union wasn't perfected. So, um, and it wasn't accepted by anybody, really. I mean, it wasn't something that, um, first of all, it never went anywhere, and then no offspring uh, resulted. Um, and so uh, a marriage that didn't result in offspring uh, might as well not have happened. Right. Uh, so you just end up with William. When the word comes back uh, from the pilgrimage that Robert is dead, uh, William is, is all they have of Robert. You have other people who are members of the ducal family who might want to be duke, but, but uh, Robert, uh, Robert's will actually is respected to the extent that uh, that William is made is made duke. He's the the main figure indelibly associated with the uh, 11th century history of Normandy as well as England, a man that uh, everybody knows thanks to the epithet the, the conqueror. His contemporaries however never call him that. To them he was uh, either William Nothus or Bastardus. So who is this personage uh, born sometime between September 1027 and September 1028? And how much do we know about his, uh, his first years? We don't know very much about his earliest years. Uh, we know a little bit about his mother. So his mother was, uh, in the English pronunciation, her Leva, the daughter of Fulbert, who was probably... Uh, Duke, Rich, uh, Duke Robert's Chamberlain. Uh, so what that means is that she was not from a very high status family, but also not from a very low status family either. So she would have been from a middling rank uh, in terms of her family background. Somebody who would not have been a wife material for the Duke of Normandy. Um, but also not a casual liaison. Uh, there's a much later story that she actually made him uh, walk, go into the castle on a horse publicly respected as his official concubine. We don't know if that really happened, but basically she was apparently able to, if not make him put a ring on it, uh, it wasn't that, uh, she was able to get him to give her some sort of official uh, recognition. And then when the liaison had taken its course, shall we say, uh, she was provided with an appropriate marriage. So uh, she married one of uh, the king's close associates uh, and had children who then became the half-siblings of the later William the Conqueror. And he did very well by those siblings. So he was very close to them. He was close to his mother and to his mother's other children, his half-siblings. Uh, so she was clearly an important force um, in his early life. William also had a, a sister in the person of Adelaide, Adeliza. We don't hear as much about uh, female children. The perennial problem. <laughs> Unfortunately, right? Um, what we do hear more about are his two half-brothers. So Robert Counts of Mortain and Odo, um, Bishop of Bayeux, um, and later Earl of Kent. Right? So uh, he had a, a, a habit, William did, of really taking care of the people that he had been close to in his early years. So the children of the people who supported him in his difficult early minority as Duke, uh, he often gave a lot of attention to and a lot of land to later on when, uh, when he conquered England. So he was, to that extent, a very loyal lord. And surely that helped in terms of recruiting people to follow him. He had that reputation of being somebody it was worth following. People tend to, to focus on the fact that he was the bastard son of the Duke of Normandy, that his mother was just a commoner. But is it possible to, to draw a parallel between uh, English monarchs like Harold Harefoot or Harthacnut and William of Falaise in, in terms of, let's say, legitimacy of rulership? 
Very much so. And here I'll go back to what I said earlier about the fact that ideas of legitimacy were very much in flux in this period. So nowadays, if you think of the English royal family, the rules of succession are very strict. Everybody knows who is supposed to succeed the current monarch. Um, Wikipedia has 60 free places of who's gonna come next. Somebody has actually worked out that there are 4,192 people in the line of succession <laughs> until you come to a genealogical dead end, right? It does not work that way in the 11th century. Yeah. Uh, because they, they don't care <laughs> about sure. rules like that. They have a lot more pragmatic things to think about. Uh, so legitimacy is one thing, but power is another. And this is perfectly illustrated in the succession dispute that happened in England in 1035. So very much exactly the same period when uh, young Duke William is taking uh, office. So 1035, the king of England, the Danish-born king, Knut, dies and leaves really a mess of a succession issue because he has children by two different women, one of whom uh, is English. She was an English noblewoman, um, Alfifu of Northampton. He was probably not married in the eyes of the church, to her, but may have been married in what the sources say is the Danish fashion, uh, more donico, uh, which is some, some sort of uh, union that would have been more recognized in the Scandinavian world. It may have not have been, you know, unions had different levels of legitimacy. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but um, I'd say that this was the common type of union in the first years of the county slash uh, duchy. The early dukes of Normandy were married in this fashion. So it is, uh, the, the church at this point is trying to make a distinction. You're married or you're not married. Lay society doesn't really completely see it that way. So you have, Knut has this one woman, but then he contracts this very official church sanctioned union with Emma of Normandy. And this is obviously a ploy for a couple of things. One, there's continuity in England because Emma of Normandy had been the wife of um, Athelred, the previous king of England. And so if you marry the queen, well, you're changing the king, but the queen's the same. You know, maybe, maybe we've got a little continuity there. But it was also a way of conciliating Normandy. So Normandy was going to be okay with Knut's rule in England if a Norman princess, essentially a Norman noblewoman, was on the throne beside him. So he's got two women, and they each have sons. And in 1035, it's really not clear who is going to succeed. Um, Knut has not left explicit instructions about this because he dies unexpectedly. I mean, he wasn't on his deathbed or anything. It's sudden illness, and off he goes. Um, and then you've got... Uh, a fraught situation because one of his sons is in Norway, one of them is in Denmark, keeping an eye on the other parts of the huge Scandinavian empire that Canute uh, ruled, and then one is in England. And unsurprisingly, if we think about it in the end, the one who's in England ends up as king. And this uh, story will be repeated in 1066 when the one who's in England ends up as king in January of 1066. So the, the debate over who is going to be king, though, doesn't end. Uh, you have a slanging match between the partisans of Harold Harefoot, who does become king, the son of Alfie, if you of Northampton, um, and, and um, Harold uh, Parthaknut, the son by Emma. And one of the, the, uh, the weapons in the rhetorical arsenal that the partisans of Harthaknut uh, aim at Harold Harefoot is not that he's illegitimate. That's what we would expect. We would expect them to say, hey, you're the son of the unofficial union, that's game over, right? No, that wouldn't have been game over by itself. Okay. What they say is that he's not actually Knut's son at all. That, you know, no one ever, never saw them together, you know, that, 
it's new uh this is yeah it's okay so yeah he had a relationship with her but this is not this is not uh her son by knut it's her son by a low-born englishman by a commoner and not even just a commoner like a, a tradesman or something right so what they're saying is essentially they're conceding the fact that if um, Harold Harefoot really had been Knut's son, he would have been in the running to be king. So you don't have an automatic disqualification on the grounds of the marital status of the parents. So it's very similar, I think, to what's going on in Normandy, where you could absolutely become king or duke as somebody whose parents weren't totally 100% officially married. This changes after that, though. And by the 12th century, it's a no-go. You have a very analogous situation in 1135 in England, when Henry I dies with no legitimate sons, he has a very plausible illegitimate son, Robert of Gloucester, who was ready on day one to be king. He would have made a great king, I think, Robert of Gloucester, but illegitimate, and that's it. You know, he, he just had no shot at it. He didn't even make a go of it. And instead he backed the case of his sister. So by that point, it was a better bet to back the claim of a woman over an illegitimate son, which in 1035 would have been inconceivable. You would have never thought of it that way. So one might say that in the 11th century, the key word was continuity, and that on both sides of the uh, the English Channel, with the difference being that in England, those around the king worried about continuity, whereas in Normandy, the, the duke himself had to, to turn it into a priority in case anything at all happened to him while on uh, on pilgrimage. He had to make sure that uh, everyone would recognize William as his legitimate heir. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the thing to keep in mind, too, is that the, the king or the duke or whoever can express their will before death. And it was important. You know, and as we'll see when we get to 1066, it, it does count for quite a bit. But after that, a lot of things happen and uh, power politics can take over. And the most important thing really is competence. You can't have an incompetent king. Uh, this is why actually minorities were relatively rare in this period. Uh, the sign of a, of a, of a, a country that is becoming uh, more bureaucratized is that they are successfully able to negotiate royal minorities without batting an eye. In this period, it was something that you tried to avoid if you possibly could. And let's face it, young William did not have an easy time of it. And it wasn't the first time in the, uh, the short history of Normandy uh, at that point, uh, because uh, William's son, Richard I, was only, I don't know, 10, 12 years of age when his father died quite violently, and uh, he had no choice but to, to take the reins of the, the county. Yeah. Now, people did grow up fast in this period. Uh, they were paying attention from an early age. There was no, there was no sheltering of children um, in this period. It's, it's wrong to say there were no childhoods in the Middle Ages. That's a historical uh, fallacy that has long been uh disproved but by the same token they weren't really sheltered they didn't know what was going on and you now william had a close personal uh, advisor murdered under the same roof when he was a young child um, many close advisors either were assassinated or came very close to being assassinated so he was quite familiar with violence on an intimate scale um, in his early years and he escaped numerous assassination attempts. So he came up in what we would think of as the school of hard knocks 
Uh, he was very aware of how contingent his existence really was and how important it was to make sure that he kept order in the duchy because his life depended on it. The first years of, of William's rule were very turbulent indeed. It was a, a period marked by a so-called anarchy, not to be confused, of course, with the homonymous uh, period in, uh, in English history. You've just mentioned uh, Henry I and uh, what happened uh, after his, uh, his death. So how would you describe the social and political climate in Normandy at this uh, particular point in, in time? Well, there were a couple of things he had to do. Uh, one of the things he had to do was make it clear that he was he was really in charge. So he had to basically go around and reduce the nobles to submission uh, one by one. Um, he had to bust members of his own family. So some of his most important enemies were actually collateral branches of the Norman ducal family. So one of the things that was usually done is that excess members of the family were given important estates or and or important positions in the church, uh, but that did not always conciliate them. So some of his most important enemies in his minority were his own cousins, uncles, etc. Uh, so uh, he faced a major rebellion. Uh, from uh, his cousin Guy of Burgundy um, and had to invoke the help of his overlord to defeat him. Uh, but he did that. He did that successfully. Uh, and the fact that he was able to uh, work out an arrangement um, with the King of France that benefited him so uh, materially is a sign of his um, diplomatic skill uh, and of his military skill. The King of France was clearly impressed uh, by this young duke. Uh, is it possible that the king might have felt that he owed this to, to William, given the support uh, shown to him by the late duke, by Robert the, the Magnificent? Certainly, yes. Uh, this is a period when the, the French kings and the Norman dukes uh, actually were getting along. That would not be the case for very much longer. Um, and in a sense, the grant of the Vexen was, it was the beginning of a, it was the beginning of a disaster. A poison chalice. It was a poison chalice because I, I think the French kings always regretted that and it became a grievance um, and it bedeviled that relationship for a century and a half until the final loss of Normandy in 1204. Uh, so basically, the, the French kings, I think, well, particularly when with Henry I, they somewhat created a monster by uh, building up the power of the Duke uh, because he was able by the end of that relationship to challenge the king of France directly. Um, and in fact, went from needing the King of France to win a big battle in 1047 to defeating the King in battle in 1054. So in seven years, the relationship morphs completely from one of uh, patronage to one of antipathy. In the context of that, the Battle of Valais uh William instituted uh, the truce of God and the peace of God. And usually when I mention these two concepts to people visiting either Caen or Falaise, I see many eyebrows being raised almost instantaneously. Was this move William made in 1047 a sine qua non condition for all his future achievements, his accomplishments? Well, the, the peace and truce of God is a, is a complicated phenomenon that a lot of people don't really um, understand if they're not deeply enmeshed in this period. Um, it has its roots in southern France in the late 10th century, and it was part of a movement, really an alliance between the church and the leading nobles, the most important nobles of the area, the counts, to crack down on disorder. This is a period when 
the writ of the French king did not really run in that part of the kingdom at all. And there weren't really many good ways of stopping localized violence. There was a lot of just local brigandage, uh, lawless knights, castellans, people who commanded maybe a castle and were essentially robber barons. Um, and so the official authorities in the church and the county would get together, hold what they call a peace council, and proclaim certain rules that they wanted everybody to swear to uphold. And then these uh, oaths were taken on sacred relics. Um, and they had to do with a couple of things. One was public order in the sense that uh, you were not supposed to attack people who couldn't defend themselves. So don't attack churches, don't attack peasants, and don't attack unarmed clergy, which should be an interesting thing to think about for a second because it implies there are armed clergy, right? So they're supposed to be able to take care of themselves, right? But unarmed clergy, you need to leave them alone. Uh, and also the tie to this were provisions about church reform. So a clerical celibacy, a bans on simony, which is the illicit selling of church offices. Uh, so these kinds of things to purify the church um, and society of things that drew us away from God. So uh, illicit violence, money, sex, all of that stuff. Uh, so this movement uh, spread north uh, and was adopted in Normandy uh, as a way of essentially pro proclaiming the official sanction of the church for Duke William's rule. So when he proclaimed the peace and truce of God, uh, he was basically saying, I'm on the side of order and on the side of God, and the church is okay with this, and the church was okay with it. And the idea was that if you were proclaiming the peace, you were you were the source of authority, and you had a monopoly on the legitimate use of violence, which should ring bells, because that's kind of the, it's a much later definition of the state. Um, so uh, the peace of God also included, as a separate provision by this point, the truce of God, which is uh, a ban on all fighting, even between people who are otherwise legitimately able to fight, um, on certain days. And by a certain point, it, it became basically from Wednesday to Monday morning, you couldn't fight. That actually kind of cuts out most of your fighting possibilities. Now, in fact, lots of battles were fought on other days. You know, Norman Conquest, you know, Battle of Hastings is fought on a Saturday. Um, so uh, they didn't know that there were battles fought on Sunday, to be honest. Um, so they didn't always respect that because a lot of times military necessity took over. Um, but when you are making a claim like this, uh, you are stating that you are the guarantor um, of God's peace. So it was a uh, it was a canny move. It was a power move uh, by William. And it wasn't the first time he'd done it. He'd, he'd done it starting in 1042, I think, is the first time uh, that he proclaimed uh, the peace. Uh, but to do it in 1047 in the midst of this rebellion was a reminder that they're the rebels. I'm the two. Well, uh, after proving himself in uh, the field of battle as a, a remarkable uh, commander, uh, after you know showing everybody that he was also a great uh, diplomat, uh, William had to start thinking about his succession. And uh, unusual as it may sound for you know the the Middle Ages, uh, evidence uh, indicates that the young duke was quite a chaste man uh, until he met the daughter of the the Count of Flanders, Baldwin the the fifth. And she was uh, quite a remarkable woman because uh, Matilda on her, her father's side was a descendant of uh, Alfred the Great. Her mom was the, the daughter of the, the King of France, Robert II. So what else do we know about this high-born woman the Duke of Normandy um, had set his eyes on? Well, you've, you've named uh, one of her major assets, uh, which was her bloodlines. Um, now, it's hard to tell whether he was thinking about the Anglo-Saxon connection as early as this. Um, he may have been keeping it in the back of his mind, who knows, but it was the French connection, I think, 
that was really important. But we should not neglect the Flemish connection uh, because Flanders was an extremely important territory. Uh, just because there's not a modern country called Flanders now, uh, I think that leads people to neglect how important Flanders was in the Middle Ages. Hugely important economically, uh, uh, kind of a hinge between uh, the empire and France, uh, and a, a key ally um, on the uh, on the Atlantic seaboard of, of Europe. So. Uh, an alliance with Flanders would have made a lot of sense uh, to uh, to William, and Matilda clearly was personally a formidable woman. Uh, she was somebody he felt very comfortable leaving Normandy, uh, uh, leaving in charge of Normandy for extended periods of time uh, later on, uh, which wasn't the case for every queen or duchess or whatever, but, but he definitely trusted her. Uh, they seem to have had a very good relationship. Uh, the only thing that they are renowned to have fought over was their errant eldest son, Robert Curthose. Uh, so they did argue about him uh, because his mother had a soft spot for him and his father thought he was really an idiot. Um, and not only an idiot, but a rebellious idiot. Um, so they did fight over that, but otherwise they seem to have been very, very close and have had, in fact, quite a loving partnership. And that's frankly unusual in royal marriages in this period to have actually a, what we might think of as a real functional marriage. Well, as the story goes, Matilda was uh, horrified at the prospect of becoming the Duke's uh, wife and uh, initially refused to, to marry him. Um, certain historians might even argue that she only had eyes for Brithric. They, um, that wealthy ambassador sent by King Edward to her father's court and um, probably one of the, the richest men in England at the time. Well, infuriated by the scorn with which Matilda had treated his proposal... It is said William got on his horse, rode to Lille, and uh, upon arrival, he seized the young Flemish princess uh, by her long hair and gave her quite a, a vicious beating. So, if one is to trust the, the 14th century chron chroniclers, this rough wooing led to a, a total change of heart in Matilda's case. Um, in your opinion, is there maybe a grain of truth in all this, or should we consider it just the later mythologizing? I'm happy to say that that story is not true, because it would reflect very badly on both of them, um, if it were. Um, the idea that, that uh, Matilda only really appreciated William's worth when he showed her who was boss is offensive, even by medieval standards. Um, it's, it's not true. Uh, the first time we come across that story is in the 13th century, which is suspicious in itself. And it was probably a part of a satirical text. Um, so I don't think it, there's any truth uh, in it. The story about the Anglo-Saxon ambassador is quite interesting, though, uh, because there is a, a kernel of truth that seems to have been elaborated into this uh, later legend about his uh, this unrequited love for the Anglo-Saxon. Um, uh, what was probably really the case is that Matilda was given the lands of this man after the conquest. So what happens after the Norman conquest is that there is a parceling out of estates to many of William's supporters, including his most important supporter, his wife. And we have records of whose lands people got. And this is in Doomsday Book. You can look it up. And they're called the, um, the antecessores. Okay, so an antecessor in this case is the person who had the land before you. And this man, Bertrand, was actually the antecessor of Matilda. We have no idea if they met each other. Uh, but what we do know is that she got his land later, and this was later elaborated into the story that she had confiscated the land. It's, that's not true. 
Uh, she just got his land in the end. He might have been dead long since. Well, although it is unlikely we will ever determine the exact date of their uh, their wedding, uh, William and Matilda got married sometime between 1051 and 1053. Um, they seem to have been ideal partners for each other. They had uh, nine or ten children, and even more surprising for those times, neither had uh, uh, any um, extramarital affairs. Uh, Not that we know of. Exactly, none that we uh, we know about. Um, historians have uh, always considered that this must have been a consequence of the, the Duke's own bastardy. Uh, is it possible that we got everything wrong and maybe Robert and her Leva lived a brief but true uh, love story, which had nothing unusual for those days and this may have fascinated William instead of actually uh, having had a, a traumatizing effect on him? You know, it, it's... We can only speculate, alas. Um, this is this is where you know if, if I had any novelistic gifts, I would I would definitely want to delve into what his what his early memories uh, would have been like because by the time little William would have been uh, conscious of his family relationships, his mother would have been already remarried were married um, to her eventual legitimate husband. So he would have probably, he would have not grown up seeing his parents as a functional couple. Uh, there would have never been something really regular about his home life in the way that we would imagine a modern nuclear family. Uh, so it's hard to tell exactly why he ended up making this very successful marriage with Matilda. But he went through a lot to make it happen because uh, the, the, there was opposition to the marriage. It just didn't come from Matilda. I, I've read that you're currently working on a on a book manuscript. Yes. Could you please tell us what is it uh, about? So the 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 manuscript I'm working on is about uh, a group of monasteries in England in the Fenlands, uh, which is actually an area very much involved in the Norman Conquest period because it was the site of a major revolt. Uh, in 1070, 1071, around the Monastery of Ely. Uh, and these are monasteries that had experienced the ups and downs of the conquest period and then of the anarchy. And then in the 12th century, um, all at the same time wrote histories of their communities. And so the book is a study of what those histories are like and what they say about the political trajectory of England in the 11th and 12th centuries. Uh, so one of the things that I look at is actually how these different monasteries depict the period of the conquest, uh, because they have different views about the conquest depending on whether uh, they end up backing um, Harold's claim or William's claim to the throne. My next question is somehow connected to this, because, um, let's say, since the foundation of Normandy in 911, Duke and Church didn't always um, uh, get along well. For example, uh, we were discussing earlier Robert's uh, pilgrimage to Jerusalem, which may have had something to do with the strained relations between him uh, and the men of God in the first phase of his, uh, his rulership. How would you describe uh, William's relation to the, the church if we are to think that uh, our main source of information um, on William is in fact the fruit of the, the work of clergymen? Well, that's very true. Uh, and he got a very good press from the church. Uh, I think he was very successful in his relationships with the church. Uh, he was able to stand for legitimacy and he was a huge supporter of church reform. So this is an age of reform uh, throughout Europe. Uh, this is a period where the church is really trying to clean house 
and uh, address some of those abuses that the peace of God had been concerned about, clerical celibacy, simony, all those kinds of things. And uh, William was a supporter of this. Now, what he wasn't a supporter of is complete autonomy for the church. He was very interested in having quite a directive role in the church in Normandy. And he didn't really meet too much opposition on this front. Norman clerics were pretty happy to let him take the lead. He presided over synods in the Archdiocese of Rouen, uh, and they were, they were quite thrilled with that. He brought in very important reformers from elsewhere. So the most important of his reign is uh, the Italian Lanfranc, uh, who starts out as prior at Lübeck, a very, very important monastic foundation, becomes the abbot of Saint-Étienne, uh, and then later, of course, Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, and William's very good reputation as a church reformer is critical later on in bringing the papacy on board for the Norman conquest because he has this track record. Uh, so when he claims that he will reform the church in England, uh, the papacy has something to look at and say, well, yeah, you probably will. Uh, and so uh, his very good and close relations with the church in Normandy actually helped pave the way for the conquest later on. If it's all right with you, I would like to, to shift our attention now to the period leading to 1066. Uh, the King of England, Edward the Confessor, uh, didn't have any uh, children, hence no uh, direct heirs. Throughout his uh, 14 years of reign, he kept looking for potential successors. As a matter of fact, he may have promised the, the throne to, to William on several occasions. The first time, I'd say probably as early as, uh, I don't know, 1051. Uh, but we also know that the Duke of Normandy wasn't the only uh, candidate, and uh, Edward surely considered several others. What should we make of this vacillation on uh, Edward's part? Does it have anything to do with his own complicated accession to the throne? It very much does. So basically, if you sort of wanted to do kind of a, a zero-sum game for where Edward was in his thoughts about the succession, it was, you know, if the, if the, the, the case of, of Duke William is here, then the case of the Godwinson family is here, and vice versa. So there's an inverse relationship between his support for the Godwinsons and his support for Duke William. There's basically two main alternatives um, to either go in that direction or go with uh, Duke William. Then you have a third possibility. And this is really the wild card. So in 1054, he froze what an American would think of as a Hail Mary pass, which is, you know, like, let's go for it. Let's see if this works. It's a long shot. And he tries to find the long lost heir. So this is uh, his uh, half nephew, Edward, just to make things confusing. Um, Historians call him Edward the Exile, just to help us keep them apart. And he had been in exile since 1016. So he, as a very, very young child, was sent out of England um, on the death of his father, Edmund Ironside, uh, who uh, was shunted away, um, uh, who was, was killed or died naturally depends on your source, in 1016, when Canute came to the throne. And Canute had the young children of his former rival, Edmund Ironside, sent to Scandinavia with the presumption that they would be quietly made away with, which did not occur. They ended up by, you know, some sort of route that we can't recover in Hungary. And one of these uh, young boys survived, grew to adulthood. Uh, uh, this is Edward the Exile, marries, has children, and he's hanging out in Hungary 
in the 1050s when all of a sudden Edward the Confessor remembers him and decides to go find him and bring him back to England. So he sends an envoy, it takes a while to locate him because nobody knows he's in Hungary, uh, but they find him and they finally convince him to come back to England, this is your moment. He's back in England by 1057. By that point, Edward the Confessor, Edward, he should also have been nicknamed the Vacillator, <laughs> um, changes his mind, doesn't see him, doesn't, re doesn't receive him. And so he's basically... They weren't even speaking the same language, so it was normal. Right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we have, no, we have no assurance that Edward the Exile could speak English at all, right? So uh, he dies a month later, before Edward the Confessor, many years before Edward the Confessor, leaving these three children. And they're just sort of quietly there. Um, and there isn't a huge big deal made out of the boy. There's a, two girls and a boy being the next heir. He, he is referred to as Edgar Atheling, Edgar the Throneworthy. But he's not groomed to be king. Um, he is not, everybody doesn't say, oh, well, of course, Edgar will as the you know heir of the House of Wessex will certainly become king. That is not the presumption. Um, and then you're back to the whole William versus Harold thing. So Harold Godwinson, the brother-in-law of the king, the most important member of this really rich and powerful Anglo-Danish family, uh, is the guy on the spot. And William of Normandy is the guy in Normandy. Um, and that's really where things stand in early 1066 when Edward the Confessor finally dies. And there is at that point no clarity about what should happen. The waters are muddied even further by the, the tapestry. William turned from a protege of the, the King of France into a serious rival. Um, he was able to stop Henry's uh, machinations in 1054 by winning the Battle of Mortimer, as you've mentioned earlier, uh, to outgeneral both the king and his ally Geoffrey of uh, Anjou at Varaville three years later, and eventually he managed to seize Maine in 1063. Um, Biotapestry illustrates the moment when Edward uh, sent his brother-in-law, Harold Godwinson, to, to Normandy to inform William uh, that he was the king's choice for the succession. If this really happened, do you think it came as a recognition of William's remarkable achievements prior to, to 1064? Um, it's entirely possible. Um, now, the question of what happened in 1064 when Harold ended up in Normandy is vexed on many fronts. There are lots of points at which you could actually debate what was really going on. Uh, the sources on the English and Norman side are unclear on a number of points. They disagree on a number of points. We know that Harold went to Normandy, um, but he didn't end up there immediately. He didn't land in Normandy. He landed in Pontieu. Now, why is that? Was he blown off course? He was heading to Normandy all the time, or was he never going to Normandy in the first place? You will get course, you will get sources that disagree on this point. I'll tell you what I think. I think he was going to Normandy, and I think it's possible that he had more than one item on his agenda. He may have been sent directly by Edward to discuss the succession. There is some sign that he may have also intended to forge some sort of alliance with William, an arrangement about what would happen after the succession. You know, like Harold would be saying, like, I'm, I'm the number one guy next to the king now. I would like that to continue when you are king. There's even some thought that there may have been a proposed marriage alliance between Harold and William between their children. Uh, if so, nothing ever came of that. Um, but there's another thing that he could have been doing there, which could have even been enough of a reason to go to Normandy without a message from King Edward, which is that his own brother, Wolfnoth, was a hostage at the Norman Ducal Court, and his nephew was as well. 
and had been for over a decade by this point. So he could have been intending to negotiate the release of his nephew and his brother. If so, that did not occur because they remained in ducal captivity for years and years after this. So there's a lot going on. And then you come to the oath, right? So there's this depiction in the tapestry of Harold taking an oath. But what is he swearing? There are words on the tapestry, and all it says is he's taking an oath. It doesn't say what the oath said. You know, the, the tapestry is very terse in terms of the, uh, there's not a lot of words. Um, we don't know exactly what he swore to do. But he clearly swore something. Because years later, the English sources figure out ways to explain the oath away. And if, if the oath didn't happen, they would have just said, that's a lie. There was no oath. Sure. But there clearly has to have been some sort of oath because they come up with reasons why um, the oath was coerced, in which case it would have been invalid under canon law, which would have gotten Harold out of it. Um, but I think he swore something, and he may have sworn to support William. And if that's the case, what happens in January of 1066? It depends on how you interpret the so-called deathbed bequest. So Edward the Confessor falls ill at the very end of 1065. He's clearly on his deathbed. And supposedly, he bequeaths the kingdom to Harold at that point. So if Edward had intended for the kingdom to go to William earlier and had sent Harold in 1064 to say, yeah, we're definitely doing that, he went back on it on his deathbed. Now, under English law, a deathbed bequest could override a previous arrangement. So Harold may have felt duty bound to respect the deathbed bequest. That absolves him of any wrongdoing. Absolves him of, absolves him of perjury, right? On the other hand, one has to ask the question lawyers ask, which is cui bono? Who does it benefit? Right? Benefits Harold. Right now, the Witan, the Witan, the close advisors of the king, uh, they ratify this deathbed bequest, and they have very good reasons for doing so. Harold is right there. Harold has a lot of land and a lot of power. If he were to oppose William, uh, that would have been very awkward. Um, we'd already had, during Edward's reign, at least one major confrontation between the Godwinson family and Edward that was only smoothed over uh, very with great difficulty. And so the idea may have been, we're better off just with the devil we know. We know this guy, Harold. He's right here. He's ready on day one. Uh, let's just go with this. Also, he's English. We don't know this William guy very well. If he's been to England, it's only once or twice. Um, and so that's what they did. And it is very likely William would have been the third option after Edgar Etheling because he was there too. They had, they had plenty of, of candidates to choose from before even considering the, the Duke of Normandy. That's true. But the thing that's interesting is I don't think Ed, Edgar Etheling really came into the running at this point, um, which is because he was young inexperienced and not at all groomed for power. So he had not grown up the way William did. So William, as I said, grew up in the school of hard knocks. He knew, uh, he knew what the military life was about from an early age. Edgar Atheling had been sitting around pretty much. Um, he was not ready to rule. Uh, and it, it would have been a real risk to put him in and I don't think it would have been very healthy for Edgar 
because I think uh, Harold would have had uh, a good reason to arrange an accident. <laughs> um, I don't think Edgar's life would have been very long. And and this, I will say this for Edgar Atling. Edgar Atling knew when to uh, when to hold him and when to fold him. Um, he was very good at figuring out when to be uh, submissive. Um, so he gave up when it was strategic to give up. And he died in his bed at the age of 75, having outlasted a lot of these people. You know, and if you if you are the legitimate heir of the Wessex dynasty and you manage to negotiate this whole period without anybody thinking they need to kill you, um, you have played politics pretty well if your aim is to survive, at least. He never ends up as a, a, a powerful person. Um, he makes a few attempts, but when they don't work, he backs off. Uh, which turned out to be a successful strategy for him. So we get to the, the moment when uh, King Edward uh, expired on January 5th, uh, 1066. Uh, according to the English sources, uh, Harold may have been crowned as early as the day of the, the Feast of the Epiphany. Um, in the context of that uh, oath we talked about earlier, William obviously uh, found all of this outrageous and turned the whole situation into a personal crusade. Um, how big a strain on Normandy was this decision made by uh, by William to go on a, I don't know, let's say a punitive expedition? And what did it entail from a logistical standpoint? It, it was a, a huge undertaking. Uh, it, it was really kind of a mad thing to think of. Uh, if you think about other people who've tried uh, an amphibious landing of Britain and have not managed to pull it off, um, you can start with, you know, the Spanish Armada, uh, Napoleon, Hitler, all of them have tried to do this. None of them succeeded. Um, the two things that you need if you're going to invade England are men and ships. Um, and you need a lot of both of those things. And in the Middle Ages, it is not easy to assemble a lot of men or a lot of ships. Um, but William succeeded in doing that. So to keep in mind, he can't just tell his men they have to go because they're not actually obliged to follow him overseas. They're supposed to help him defend Normandy, and this is not part of that. Uh, this is really something that he's doing on spec. Uh, and so he has to convince them to go. And we have, we have later reports of what the discussion was around the council table. And obviously, we don't really know what was said. Um, what we probably have here is historians rehearsing arguments that, that might have been made. Uh, but, uh, but basically, he's able to prevail. He's able to convince people, no, this is worth doing, and we can do it. Um, and he assembles a coalition, not just of Normans, but of Bretons um, and Flemings and people from other parts of France. So there's a lot of people who think this is worth trying because uh, we're going to get rich out of it. So that's the kind of leader that William was. He had a track record. People thought this was going to be a, a success. He also needs to build a lot of ships because you don't have lying around in this period the kind of fleet that can carry 8,000 guys um, and several thousand horses um, across the English Channel. So they basically gather together all the ships that already exist. Um, we have a list, in fact, uh, a ship list that you know, lists the contributions. Um, and then he had to build a lot of ships. And there are actually illustrations on the Bayou Tapestry of some of the ships being built. Um, and there's a later story that uh, Duchess Matilda contributed the flagship um, that William sailed in across uh, the channel. And that was his special ship, uh, the Mora. Uh, so they have to get them together. And then they have to wait for the wind. And they wait, and they wait, and they wait. And the whole time that they're waiting, they have to eat. And so basically for two months, you have 8,000 guys and a couple thousand horses who need to eat. And a historian has actually calculated how many carts of grain probably had to be brought in um, while they were waiting around. And also how many carts had to take away the, uh, the waste product generated by, uh, by that many uh, men and horses lying around doing nothing for all that time. Uh, so it was it was a testament to his logistical skills. First of all, that people didn't just drift away. 
you know, there are many, many incidents of uh, armies that sort of evaporated over time if they weren't given enough to do. It was also a testament to his ability to keep the camp relatively hygienic that they didn't succumb to disease because one of the hugest risks to a medieval army was disease. You get that many human beings in one place in medieval conditions and they give each other diseases. Um, and that didn't happen. Um, so uh, they are actually able to hold it together for the whole time it takes for the wind in the channel to turn.